DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation, or the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's the author of Hidden Mountain, the Secret Garden, a Theological Contemplation of Prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of conversations, we discuss the letters of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Anthony, thank you once again for joining me. Thanks for having me on and for walking through these letters with me. Well, this is a really interesting letter that we're about to talk on. It was originally written in 1903, and it's to her aunts. We really don't hear very much about her extended family. Well, she writes to her aunts periodically, and I think this is the first letter that we've done to her aunts. So these would be her mom's sisters, and they're younger, a little bit younger. So they're, even though they're a little older than Elizabeth, they're closer to her in age, I believe, than her mom. And, and so this kind of makes this conversation fun. They went on vacations and they had a lot of fun together. And this letter reminisces on that, but also tells her aunts about her experience now as a Carmelite. And in this letter, there's this beautiful theme about um, even though I'm here in Carmel, I'm still connected with you. Where distance, geographic distance, really is nothing compared to the bond we have in Christ. But there's another note in this letter which makes it very interesting. A couple other fun things. One, this letter is the first indication that Elizabeth has come out of kind of the dark night that was her novitiate after she entered Carmel and then she enters into a novitiate. And it seems like everything, for a little while, every all the reasons why she went into Carmel all of a sudden seem to have eluded her. And she she's wondering, what what am I doing? Am am I worthy to be here? This uh, you know, maybe this isn't the, the what God really wants me to do. Well, since that time she's taken her vows now and she has this deep peace. And this piece is so deep and so beautiful, it comes out in her handwriting. Her handwriting in this letter is actually just exquisite. Before, her handwriting was kind of uh, difficult to read, almost illegible in some ways. But in this letter, it, it just it just flows beautifully. And so different scholars have said, okay, she's emerged out of her, of her dark night. She's uh, the uh, Lent is, is over, she's approaching Easter, and a new joy has, uh, has, has taken hold in her life. And then there's a final thing, though, that, that you would almost, almost think was toxical, and that is the convent is facing somewhat imminent exile. The French government has passed a law which uh, all uh, the French religious must leave France and their lands be confiscated by the state. And so when she's writing this letter, she'll make an oblique reference to uh, how much she loves uh, her life at Carmel, but maybe God is going to take it all away. And uh, the context for that is to understand that the, the monastery is under under persecution and uh, is facing exile. So they've looked at a new home in Switzerland, uh, kind of a a schoolhouse in Switzerland, and they've already begun to move some of their furniture. Now, in fact, the monastery will never be forced to move, but but laws have been passed and things have been set in motion, and uh, the stability that Elizabeth has on a natural level is thrown somewhat up uh, in doubt, rather than being caught up or overly excited about that, you'll notice in this letter, she keeps it focused on her relationship with her aunts and the beautiful graces that God has given her.
Letter 162 to her Roland aunts, April 28th to 30th, 1903, Dijon Carmel. My good little aunts, it seems to me that Carlipa and Dijon are very close, for my heart has quickly jumped the distance to go find yours. And my divine bridegroom gives me wings like this so I can fly off to you. The wings are prayer. And then this unity in faith and love creates the communion of saints. I have many things to tell you, my little aunts, but where to begin? Oh, if you knew how beautiful Holy Week is in Carmel. I wish you could have attended our beautiful offices and especially on our beautiful feast of Easter. On that day, we chant matins at three o'clock in the morning. We enter the choir in procession, wearing our white mantles, each holding a candle and singing the Regina Chaley. At five o'clock, we have the Mass of the Resurrection, followed by a magnificent procession in our beautiful garden. Everything was so still, so mysterious, that it seemed our master was going to appear to us along the solitary paths as he once did to Mary Magdalene. And if our eyes did not see him, at least our souls met him in faith. Faith is so good. It is heaven in darkness. But one day, the veil will be lifted, and we will contemplate in his light him whom we love. While awaiting the bridegroom's fanny, we must spend ourselves, suffer for him, and above all, love him greatly. Thank him for having called your little Elizabeth to Carmel for the persecution. I do not know what awaits us, and this perspective of having to suffer because I am his delights my soul. I love my dear cloister so much. And sometimes I have wondered if I don't love this dear little cell too much, where it is so good to be alone with the alone. Perhaps one day he will ask me to sacrifice it. I am ready to follow him everywhere, and my soul will say with St. Paul, who will separate me from the love of Christ? I have within me a solitude where he dwells, and nothing can take that away from me. Geet had the good idea of passing your dear photographs on to me. I introduced you to our Reverend Mother, since she has heard her little lamb, who loves you so much, speak about you for so long. I was also delighted to show her your dear house. What sweet memories it brings back to me. I spent so many wonderful vacations, certainly the best, there among you. And the Ser, is it still so beautiful? What fine prayers must be offered there. Would you tell Monsieur le Curé that I send him my soul to stay the office with him in that dear little valley, pay him my respects, and ask him to pray much for me? He is so good. I'm sure he will really want to remember me at his Mass. My little aunts, if you knew how I love your beautiful breviaries, I can't say it enough, and each time I use them, I take your souls with mine to enter into communion with all heaven. I assure you that you have made me very happy. They follow me everywhere. And day and night, my prayer for you is my thank you. I am leaving you to go to Matins with you. I still have many things to tell you, but there's the bell. So I only have time to kiss you, as well as my good aunt, from the best of my heart, your little Elizabeth of the Trinity, R.C.I. 
Pray for my dear mama. Events have really saddened her, but her courage edifies me, and I thank him who has given me such a good one. Hello to Anna. Doesn't it describe a beautiful moment in the life of Carmel? It sounds like a honeymoon, doesn't it? Yeah, I suppose it does. For me, I was just going to that early in the morning, before the sun rises at 3 o'clock in the morning, waking up, chanting the Psalms together, and then in doing it in this beautiful procession. You know, I can almost picture it with the candles and their white mantles going into the procession, and then praying, really keeping vigil till five o'clock, and then another magnificent procession. And she's caught up in the beauty of it. And in the beauty of it, she says, it's almost like she's going to meet Christ, the risen Lord, just like Mary Magdalene did in the garden. She's expecting to see him in the garden of their cloister as they're, as they're processing through it. And I, I guess the, uh, the point is that... Um, in our lives of faith, in order to go into deep prayer, sometimes something beautiful like this is so very important. You know, going to the Easter vigil, I think, is something that enriches our prayer life when we take that extra time. I know a lot of people don't like to go to the Easter vigil, but I think going to the Easter vigil or any vigil is a beautiful thing to do because it's never a convenient thing to do. You have to make time for it. But when you do, and when it's celebrated well, it plants these impressions of grace in the soul, it kind of connects you with the scripture and the mystery that we're celebrating together in a way that if you were just by yourself and just reading a Bible text by yourself, you could never do. Something about the liturgy, especially the Easter liturgy, but every liturgy, heaven and earth uh, touch, they embrace in that moment. And Elizabeth here is letting herself get caught up in it. And you're right about this. Uh, in particular, she's letting herself get caught up in it under a certain note. And the note is that of the bridegroom. And so in that sense, you're right. This is this is like a honeymoon phase. She passed through this difficult time and now a deeper kind of love and devotion of taking a hold of her heart. You might say the romanticism of religious life has wrapped itself around her, and she's let herself be wrapped up by it. It's, it's helped leading her into deep contemplation. Is that something that I think even for those who have gone through a conversion process, whether they've been brought in through the church through an RCIA or they've experienced something maybe even through a Crisio or maybe just something explodes in their life of grace, that you have this magnificent gift that comes with faith, and you just want to cherish it and hold on to it. But for so many, Anthony, that moment does transition into something else, doesn't it? It it does. I I think, though, enjoying the grace and receiving the grace, okay, stop. This grace that you've just received, you need to realize that this is the most real thing in your life. This wasn't the product of your imagination. This wasn't you having a a little fantasy trip, and so now you can go on and the rest of your life is the same. What you've just received is a gift from heaven, and you need to sit with this gift and treasure it and receive it into your heart and let it shape you. You need to spend time with this gift. That's a little bit what's happening with Elizabeth right now in this Easter grace, is that she's passed through a difficult novitiate and believe it or not, during the difficult novitiate, in that kind of night when it seemed like nothing was going on, she was questioning whether she was wasting her time or not, God was communicating something exquisite to her soul. And that exquisite thing that was being communicated to her during her dark night, now in this Easter morning, has been disclosed to her. She positions herself, she sees herself like a, a Mary Magdalene someone who encounters the risen Lord, someone the Lord sends to share about his presence to others. And so there's where she sees herself. This is how she's receiving the grace that she experienced in prayer during the dark time. 
And now you're asking what's going to happen after this. Uh, obviously, the community is about to face a difficult time of trial. And she doesn't realize this herself. She'll have several months. She'll be in, in really great health, maybe for about a year. And then a mysterious illness is going to dawn on her. They'll discover it's Addison's disease. But because of the way she's receiving this grace right now, she is being prepared so that when she does begin to contract Addison's disease, rather than seeing Addison's disease as something that will thwart or prevent or hold back or impede in any way her mission, she's going to see the mission of God being accomplished even as the disease completely disables her. She knows that the grace that she's received is something nothing on heaven or earth can stop. It's a gift from heaven entrusted to her soul, waiting to give forth beautiful fruit in the church. The bridegroom is going to make Elizabeth fruitful. It is very compelling, especially given the, the time of this letter and who she's speaking to, that she would write a line that would convey so much truth. I mean, it, this one line jumps out at me anyway, Anthony, in this particular paragraph, where she says, faith is so good. It is heaven and darkness. When you live by faith, when you treasure the moments of grace that God gives you and you take time to receive those, when you order your life so that you're living your whole life by faith, you, instead of living your life by what's comfortable or convenient or impresses other people or goes with the flow, if you choose to live your life by faith, you, you stand out and things are different. If you pray by faith, you're your prayer is lifted up in a different kind of way. If she has a devotion to the bridegroom, she believes that the bridegroom loves her excessively. And she's going to tell other people that, that the Lord loves them excessively. Each one of them is a treasure for his heart. And you have deep faith in that when you allow your heart to receive the gift of that kind of love into your life. Your life begins to change, and you're able to face things that that you wouldn't otherwise be able to uh, face. I think the paragraph right now is so important, especially for our time and the time in which we find us. Chris, so many people today live in such difficult circumstances. For some, the difficult circumstances are a family life or a marriage that have fallen, has fallen completely apart. For others, it might be a job situation or or their reputation in the community. Everything has been robbed them and everything has been shattered around them. Or for others, it might be a situation where all the people who were once close to you are, are gone. You find yourself incredibly alone, incredibly lonely and feeling disconnected. Well, without faith, whatever those circumstances are, those difficult, challenging circumstances, without faith, they're impossible to bear. Uh, we we find ourselves overwhelmed and, and even crushed. But with faith, it's not that the sorrow is any less crushing. It's not that the sting of having lost people who are very close to us around us or or the, the humiliation of our of a family life shattered around us doesn't hurt. Of course these things hurt. But with faith, those things don't ultimately get to define who we are. With faith, what we can choose is to enter into the love of God and to realize that the love of God is even greater than those heart-wrenching things that have happened in our lives. That the love of God is more powerful and more part of who I am than all those difficulties put together. So if persecution comes from the government or the persecution comes from a family member, or persecution comes from a friend, or persecution comes at the job place. If you experience persecution, where your heart should be is, you know, thank you, Lord God, that you have found me worthy to be persecuted, to suffer in this way, because you said, blessed are the persecuted. And so for anyone who's experiencing right now alienation and disconnection and sorrow and rejection, praise God for that gift. And follow Elizabeth's example. In her words, what you hear is someone 
who has a beautiful, beautiful, powerful virtue only faith can give you and that can be yours if you choose to believe in God's love. That virtue, Ignatius of Loyola calls it indifference. Indifference is not a virtue that makes us indifferent to people or to the beautiful things that God has made in this world. That's not indifference. That's stoicism, and it's not Christian. In Christian indifference, you love people, just like she's Elizabeth of the Trinity is writing her aunts whom she loves so much. And she's even remembering all the beautiful places that they visited. Carlipa, for example, is a beautiful town in southern France outside of Carcassonne. It's just a lovely place. All those things are treasures to her. And she's not indifferent to those things any more than she's indifferent to her little ants. But what is she indifferent to? She's indifferent to anything that is not God's will for her. And so if it ever became God's will for her not to live in the cell that she loves so much, she'll let go of the cell and be open to what he wants. If it's ever God's will that they not be there in Dijon, that they have to go to Switzerland, which the community was thinking about doing, she was ready to go. She wasn't going to let those kind of circumstances crush her or break her because her solitude with the Lord, the immensity in which she would lose herself, wasn't something that was dependent on the cell or living in Dijon or any, any other external factors. Her intimacy with the Lord was completely rooted in the gift of faith that she had received in his presence. The bridegroom was coming to her soul. He's coming in such wonderful ways. He's coming for her right now in this present moment. And that's the greatest truth. All the other uh, circumstances, the persecutions, uh, missing people whom you love, those were all secondary to the great truth about his coming to her now. And this is the way we can live too. Also, very poignant in this letter, how she is fed, if, if I may use that that word. She's fed by the communion in relationship with her family members. And what I mean by that is in that second paragraph where she continues to reflect not only on the memories of their shared experience, but even in the gift of a bravery, that somehow and by praying with that bravery, she's united in prayer with those who she loves. And then even showing those pictures, her reverend mother, to be able to share and all that feeds her, doesn't it? You also hear about the sanctification of, of a place, the valley in which they live, where Elizabeth loved to pray and found communion with God. And so this brings another beautiful aspect of our reflection, and that is when we pray, places where we pray, we're sanctifying those places where we pray. If you have a favorite spot in your life, or in your home, place where you like to go on vacation. If you bring prayer there, if you bring the Lord into that place and spend some time with him there, perhaps praying the office or using that little, one little periodical called the Magnificat, and allow yourself to be drawn into the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is very real, and it sanctifies that place where you're at. So that place has been touched by grace. And I think that's a powerful thing to think about as we ponder our own lives. Sometimes we look at vacations and so forth as an, an escape from real life. But really what a vacation is, it's, it's meant to anticipate heaven. And in heaven, we spend time with those whom we love and we spend time with God. And as if you're pondering taking a vacation for yourself, you might think about that. How can I sanctify this place that God has privileged me to be able to go for my vacation. And if you can't go, how can I uh, bring God's presence into my home or my backyard or, uh, or to this park where I love to go and have a picnic? I don't know where it might be, but wherever it is, God wants to bring his presence there and transform that place. What else can we receive from this particular letter from St. Elizabeth? Well, just Kind of by way of review, she this letter is kind of rich because she brought us right into Easter and Carmel and those processions and the candlelight and the early mornings of 
the or early hours of the morning, rather. Uh, you can see her in her white mantle walking through the cloisters in procession and that beautiful kind of first light that comes. And in that light, you know, expecting like Mary Magdalene to encounter the risen Lord by her bridegroom. That rich liturgical experience is something that she shares with her aunts. And she shares it not in the abstract, but right in the face of the, a persecution that's looming over the community. She's not worried about the persecution. You don't have that in here at all. Instead, you see this holy indifference that whatever God's will, I'm ready for it. And then finally, the, the, this third part of this uh, beautiful letter, you see this personal connection. In other, in other words, she's able to share with them the heights of Carmel, this beautiful encounter with Christ in the early hours of Easter, but also the difficulty of persecution and the unease about them. All of this in the letter, and she's able to share, share it with them humbly and simply because she loves her aunts, and she shares beautiful treasures, and her faith in the Lord and her love for the Lord hasn't taken her aunts away from her. Uh, this faith has drawn her closer to them and bound her together with them so that when she prays, somehow they're benefiting even right now from the, the prayer she's offering. And this is the beauty of our faith. Faith opens us up to these powerful, powerful graces in prayer that carry, we carry with us throughout all our lives. And faith allows us to stand firm in the midst of persecution and not lose heart even when the whole world falls apart around us. Because no matter what happens, we can always love God. Finally, faith binds us to those that we love. So that no matter what happens, rather than falling apart or falling away from each other, we find ourselves more affectionately uh, connected with one another, even more involved in each other's lives. How beautiful that recalling and cherishing memories it's truly a gift, isn't it? I mean, memories, things of the past, but they become so incredibly important to the present. Yeah, well, that's the beauty of praying about, through these letters together is that, you know, you have somebody's life uh, in really deep, intimate moments open up for you, and you get to see her friendship and some of the things that she treasured in your heart. And instead of just being uh, an abstract person from the early 20th century, all of a sudden right now she is... Uh, someone who's very real to us and is so very human. And you get to share her heart. And you want to believe that if we're sharing her heart right now, she's praying for us so that we might be able to enjoy the grace of deep prayer that she had, that she believed it was her mission to promote in the church. Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you. It's beautiful to share this with you, and I look forward to our next visit. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or download the free Discerning Hearts app located at the iTunes and Google Play app stores. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will First, pray for our mission, and if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lullis.